Welcome back to The Pulse. Now, today is Tuesday, a normal day in many parts of the world. But in the central and Ashanti regions where the river of Finn passes, women and girls are not allowed to cross the river on these days. An age-old taboo bans them from crossing the river when they are menstruating. As my colleague Jojo Kobna found out, this old discriminatory tradition is hampering girl-child education and limiting social economic activities of females. River Fen in both Central and Ashanti regions is very sacred. There is an unwritten rule in all communities along the river and women should not cross it on Tuesdays. In the community of Dencha Chechere, this rule is enforced to the letter. Also, when women or girls are menstruating, they are forbidden from crossing. It is believed that the curse will befall the community when women break this taboo. The river is having a god of man. So that thing is born on Tuesday. For this reason, it is the Tuesdays when the spirits revoke in the river. Maybe some menstrual cycle and those uh, things that we know mention of. We cannot mention of. So as if we mention those things or we detail that things to the river, it's unclean. So our people or our elderly men saw that all those things attached to women are unclean for that day, Tuesday, because that Tuesday, the gods or uh, the ancestors of the river may uh, uh, have some pacification or something like that. So, so it's taboo for a woman to attend to the riverside on Tuesdays. I'm from I didn't feel 14 years. I me to school. St. John Methodist Basic School, Mitsi Village, Pakapa Village. My base school at Chere, and so I was on my band just to cross the river and so on my back. Obu and Sansu, I want me cross the river and if you say it's a boo, it doesn't seem so. To a friend, Teresa Glover, I didn't feel 13 years. And I do Tuesdays and so I. A young man in to me, my school boys, and a year almost to me back. Dorcas and Theresa and many other girls have to cross a river to get an education. So we are currently crossing the Orphan River, and the gods of this river are against girls like Theresa and then Dorcas from menstruating and crossing it. They're against that. They're also against them from crossing on sacred days such as Tuesdays. One very interesting thing is the gods are not against people who are mining in this river. It's quite interesting. It's a journey where they have to cut through thick cocoa plantations for one hour. But on Tuesdays and on days that they menstruate, they cannot do that. It is an ancient taboo that is enforced even today. Women and girls are questioning the relevance of this taboo what is affecting their education? It is not fair. It is not fair because every day the boys go to school and study. But we, the girls, we can't study all the days. A peep through the school register shows the full story. Many girls who live across the river are absent from school. Young girls are now questioning this blatant discriminatory practice. According to the girls, the boys do better in school because of this archaic belief. five days or four days to give girls the best education, some parents have rented rooms in Chichere so the girls would return to them on weekends and when they are not menstruating. Me bad dog as you say. Say, say, why I a yik a class. See, as I say, on to me, go school, I ain't a blood antenna, Miss Uncle Eclum. Say, see, I answer a boy's boy's for Musa woman. 
Anka eye e kladia na se ekrom dia. Anka matumi ahwe no su yi. Ama Mansa recounts going into labor on a Tuesday. According to her, crossing the river was not possible because of the taboo. The chief of her community, who has a responsibility to appease to the gods of the river, were the goats and gin, before she could cross, was not around. So she had to walk for over two hours westwards before accessing a health facility to deliver. I want to come a brand new match. 30th match, and I come here. I did a panel. Now I'm black, come here. I'm a Gina, I'm like in a yard, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I say, I say, I say, I told me, I cry, and I say, into me, I say, I cry, I cry, I be my mom could do in Sina. No, I was never born by say. Yamia de. On your mocker crack, and to me, Jamiko do crumb and quan de. I say, buy a dim poa. And the name was a doctor for a day. Munjin, I'm so now had de. Almost all moon to me, ma. Dear one, I obey and when a crack cried, they are counting on the bomb pile soon when your missus say, Oh, mommy, I'm to be changed soon. I'm good, Kruma. Doctor Fons, what in my own. Ama could easily have died because of this taboo or lost her baby. She does not want to challenge the river god and the old age culture. She simply wants the government to build a bridge over the river so they can cross at will. Margaret Kokoi's son drowned in the river of Fen. Her son was on his way to school when the canoe accidentally capsized and he died. Anytime she crosses the river, she recollects this painful memory. She wants the government to build a bridge over the river so that no child would cross the river to school. Until then, this discriminatory practice would continue to hinder the development of girls and women. Jojo Kobna, Joy News. Charles Wright International wants government to, as a matter of urgency, deal with this challenge. Bright Apia is its executive director. From the, the Charles Wright perspective, uh, you could see that there's a clash between the right to education of the girl child and then culture. And when that happens, there's a clear way out for us to determine as to what is necessary for the development of the child. Uh, we know that when it comes to the right of education, even at the global level, it is, it is compulsory and it must be free. That is the kind of commitment given to various states to, uh, to, to ensure. Then you also look at our constitution. It is something that we can enforce to ensure that nothing would uh, impede that process for the enjoyment of the right to education. So if you pick the two, then we also need to balance it to see which one is more relevant in terms of the development of our children and what, what understanding do we want them to have within the cultural context. Because just as the, uh, the, the, the last lady said, there's a history to it, and you also laid emphasis on it, that there's a history to it. And all these things must be clearly, uh, we must have clear understanding of all those things so that we can place the context. But whatever it is, our legislation is so clear that anything that will impede on the right to education uh, should be considered as a bad practice. Therefore, there must be a way of, of, for us to deal with it. In any case, if it is about uh, uh, women being in their menstruation or the girls are being in their menstruation to access education, the, there, are, there are so many ways that a child can keep herself 
to have access to education that will not have any effect on the cultural practices, whether it is a taboo for them to cross the river or not. So we also have to find ways and means to also handle that cultural aspect in the context in which they understand it so that we can still pave way for the girl child to have access to education. The state must also sit down and look at it and say that this is a bad practice. It's hindering the progress of our children. It's hindering their development. And if this is the way culture wants to go, then we also need to find our way out to ensure that uh, they have access to education. But when you pick the law, a right to education should proceed that of culture. So we need to respect that in relation to children. I'm, I'm saying this in relation to children because our laws make a special case for the girl child and their children. So these are things that for me, we have to look at. First, provide the understanding of what culture is seeking to do in respect to this kind of menstruation. Once we're able to do that, I think that uh, we will find a way out uh, to deal with this particular case where our, our, our children have access to education. Let's broaden the conversation and speak with Kofi Asari, who is with the Africa Education Watch. I'm grateful for your time, Kofi Asari. What's your reading of this old age taboo hampering girl child education and also limiting socioeconomic activities of females? Um, yeah, um, good afternoon and good afternoon to your cherished so audience. And um, there are definitely, you know, inimical traditional practices that impede um, on the right to education. And the scenario we are observing is, is a perfect example of such um, traditional beliefs, customs, and practices that um, um, inhibit or prohibit um, girls' access to um, education. Uh, there's always that balance between culture and also rights. And uh, I think that uh, stakeholders in the society have a responsibility to mitigate and ensure that that balance is created. I have worked in communities in Chifopraso area where there were similar uh, prohibitions, but then um, there was a balance. Rituals were made and then it was possible for um, the river to be crossed on certain days, you know, of the week, just because children had to go to school. And so it is not a cast in stone matter of there not being, you know, a, a solution to this. I think that if the traditional authorities, custodians of, of the land, are engaged by the education authorities. It should be possible for some rituals to be performed um, to exempt uh, students from these very important um, cultural practices. And that is where the common ground, I believe, um, rests. It is possible to have that engagement. OK, so um, it's possible. Where do we begin from? Because at one breath, we want girl child enrollment to increase in our schools. At another breath, uh, girls are being faced with this obstacle of going to school. How do we balance it? How do we deal with um, um, some of uh, these obstacles? And at the same time, not hurting our cultures, traditions, and beliefs. I heard you talk about, um, I mean, pouring libation or compensate. Is it something that would be very easy to deal with? It is not impossible because, as I said, when I was working in Chupra, so there were days that it was a taboo um, to, to cross the river in, in most of the communities. And in the communities that I worked, we had to cross the river regularly. And so for students, certain rituals were performed uh, to enable them, you know, um, gain some exclusive exclu exclusion rights in respect of the observance of that taboo on those days because of their right to education. It was possible because the traditional authority appreciated um, the enormity and the importance of the right to education and the extent to which it shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be truncated or it shouldn't be you know, uh, interfered uh, by any, any cultural practice. And so that engagement must come from the Ghana Education Service. The GAS should engage traditional authorities in the communities in question and have a discussion about um, how to manage the two rights. After all, after all, 
the children in question are children of the traditional authorities and children of the people whom these traditional authorities exercise their traditional, traditional jurisdiction over. And so I don't think it is an impossible situation. It may be difficult, but it's not impossible because we've seen so many communities um, uh, perform rituals uh, to exempt students from most of these practices. And I think that an engagement with the traditional authority should be um, the, the first step forward in, in, in ensuring that this obstacle is removed to ensure girls are able to go to school every day of the week. Um, so it doesn't affect the quality of their education, it doesn't affect their, their retention in school, and they're able to complete school and uh, with the quality learning outcomes. What, what's the role of the gender ministry in all of this? Well, um, this is an issue um, involving girls. Okay, so again, once it's girls, two ministries come into play because the girls are children. So the Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection have a stake, and then the education service also has a stake. Um, they are, I mean, for many issues that affect girls' education, both ministries have common grounds. Um, but this is not out and out a social protection issue, but it is out and out um, an education issue because it's an issue of a practice impeding access. And that lies squarely within the purview of the Ministry of Education. And because the two ministries work together to promote the rights of girls when it comes to um, social services, especially education, um, a collaboration between the two would strengthen their, um, their, their resolve and their position and strengthen their negotiation as they engage traditional authorities to mitigate um, some of these uh, traditional uh, beliefs and practices that are inimical to the rights of girls to education. Kofi Asari is Executive Director of Africa Education Watch. I'm extremely grateful for your time this afternoon. When I return from the break on the pulse, we'll be going straight to Kumasi, where the MCA Sampang has been endorsed and confirmed by Assembly members, but not without challenges. We have details shortly after this break. Welcome back to The Pulse, and you can also join the conversation via all our social media handles. It's at Joy News on TV. You can also tweet at us with the hashtag The Pulse. Also remember, we are streaming live on YouTube. My personal handle is at the Nana Aisha. Let's move straight to Kumasi, because the presiding member of the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly, Stephen Ofori, says an impeachment process could be initiated against a new city mayor if he fails to clear the Assembly's 50 million city debt. It. The government reached an agreement with leadership of the assembly to pave the way for the endorsement of Sampine as Metro Chief Executive. The assembly members have threatened to vote against the president's nominee if the debt was not cleared. On the debt issue, the uh, president had an opportunity to be interviewed at a pure FM, and that commitment was made. And when the president speaks, it, it, it holds that uh, power. So, and in his attempt, he also sent the regional minister and the chief of staff to come to us to have a dialogue with us that um, we should hold on to that uh, agitation. After the confirmation, we should have a roundtable discussion to uh, iron the, all those uh, issues. So now, I think um, the father of the land has gotten to uh, accept our message, and we will give him some uh, respite for some time. Uh, to uh, see to as to how best uh, he will respond to that. If he, he doesn't, certainly we are the seven members. We know the way out. Mr. Sampine, in his acceptance speech, indicated his readiness to partner with all stakeholders for effective management of the city. In accepting this one episode of me, I would like to show gratitude to the Almighty God. The President of the Republic, His Excellency Nana Abuzanko, my regional minister, my regional chairman and executive of the party, the region, 
Mr. F. F. Antu, the second vice chairperson of the New Patriotic Party, and all of you who played a major role in this journey, my appreciation to all. I accept and acknowledge the fact that a huge task is placed on my shoulders, but with determination, hard work, and the assistance of all the stakeholders, I am optimistic of telling a success story at the end of my tenure. Let's take you live to the uh, Prempa Assembly Hall in the Ashanti Regional Capital of Kumasi for the very latest. My colleague Nanaya Ojima joins us with more. Nanaya Ojima, uh, tell us how it all went down in uh, the confirmation of Sampine. It was a very calm atmosphere within the um, Prempa Assembly Hall here in Kumasi. Uh, where immediately we went there, we found a number of the Assembly members all seated. And um, we started, as usually, with the prayer. I had uh, um, various uh, um, uh, dignitaries who were supposed to be in the meeting all coming in and trying to speak um, to the assembly members to endorse the nominee of, uh, by, by the government. So the uh, presiding member started, and he spoke to the assembly members about the debt, the need to endorse the nominee to ensure that the debt is paid. And according to him, they should um, vote uh, for the, the, the nominee um, on the basis of his competence. And, and that he believed that if he is elected or endorsed to take the seat of the uh, Metropolitan Chief Executive, he will be able to help them pay the debt. So what he said um, from the results, and went down well with the assembly members. And um, at a point, uh, it looked like the, uh, the, it, it, was this, it, had, it had been decided. Um, they, they had decided to endorse the candidate or the nominee before they came in, because from the reaction of the assembly, um, the assembly members and also um, from the, the conversations that, were, that went on within the assembly hall, the Pemper assembly hall, everything showed that the president's nominee will be confirmed. So at the end of the day, when the um, Electoral Commission counted the ballots and uh, uh, declared um, to tell us that Mr. Pine has been able to secure 55 votes out of the 58 people who showed up to cast their ballot, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a surprise for the people. Uh, already people had started jubilating. And um, everybody in the, in, in the hall, you, you could see excitement all over in the hall. It's showing that um, a lot of people were anticipating the acceptance of the president's nominee. Looking at the confusion that has greeted his confirmation, how did uh, Mr. Sampine himself respond to this massive endorsement? So in, within his acceptance speech, he uh, refused to talk about the um, issues that the debts and how they are going to make sure that these debts are paid. But um, he was happy and um, throughout the process, uh, at a point you see him smile as the assembly members are called to cast their ballots. Um, he, he, he will look at them um, uh, and plea. Uh, everything showed that he, he saw that uh, there's a high chance of him becoming the Metropolitan Chief Executive. And um, after, afterwards, um, you could see him going around um, thanking all of the assembly members. And within his acceptance speech, again, he thanked them and also thanked the president for his intervention through the, um, uh, the, 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 the radio interview he granted on a local radio station. And also through by sending the regional minister and also the chief of staff to the uh, presiding member to talk to him about the debt and assuring them that if the nominees endorse the government through the local government ministry, will work together with the Commerce Metropolitan Assembly to investigate uh, the, the debt itself and find ways of um, dealing with the debt.
And now, Jima is our man monitoring um, events at the KMA for us. Prince Apia was also monitoring at Sokori Mampo in the Ashanti region. Uh, Kennedy Kankam was nominated as municipal chief executive. He has today received the blessings of the assembly members obtaining 100% approval votes. Prince Apia joins me via Zoom for more. Prince Apia, was it different from what we witnessed at the KMA? Yes, um, I would say it was a little bit different from the KMA. But over here, uh, because earlier there were this um, kind of tension in the um, at municipality, a lot of people had come out to insist that they wanted somebody who is a resident of Asakaramapo or their Samasi constituency. So they felt he was an outsider. That's how they described him. And so um, a lot of people were calling for the assembly members to uh, reject him. And so it was um, a place to watch out for. So today, for instance, there were a heavy security presence at the uh, venue where um, the exercise took place, the new office complex, and a lot of security were were there. Again, uh, a lot of high ranked persons were also available to ensure that things go on well. But interestingly, after the votes were cast, out of the 22 assembly members present, he pulled all the 22 votes that were cast. And it was interesting because even before the um, all the 22 cast their vote. Uh, people were jubilating and making noise and chanting his name that he's the new MCE, he's getting 100%. And all through um, till the end, he had um, all the votes cast for him. And so uh, over here, he was really excited by his words. He was both excited and sad because earlier when his name was uh, mentioned, uh, because the and mixed reactions and people were claiming he didn't understand the dynamics of the kind of politics done at the square man, but he might not be able to understand the challenges that the people face. As a result, he cannot be the best man for the job. And people were even asking that why not the shortlisted persons who went for the vetting, any of them could have been appointed out. And so for him, he was sad about the outcome of that. And so he and deliberately ensure that he didn't grant any radio interviews during the period and so as to calm nerves. And um, aside that, he was happy that all the assembly members had come together to vote uh, massively for him. And he um, indicated that that meant that all of them are together, all of them are one. And he called for continuous unity among the assembly members and the people of Asperma and so that he will be able to champion the kind of development that um, the president has asked him to, and then continue the kind of work that Ali Dussain, the former MC, had already started. And so for him, he's excited. Two things he mentioned um, in his speech. One is the fact that um, he had declared that nobody should go out there to jubilate. The reason was hinged on what has happened earlier because uh, one, a lot of the, uh, the shortlisted persons who went for the vetting were not choosing, their supporters were in town. Two, a lot of people felt he wasn't part of the Asperma municipality. And so it, when his supporters go out there to jubilate or process on the streets of Asperma it could raise some um, tension and friction. And so he advised that nobody goes out there to celebrate. If you can jubilate, if you want to celebrate, to do that in your rooms. Two, he mentioned what he wanted to do for the uh, Asperma municipality. And then that was when he mentioned the pencil factory, the defunct pencil factory. He said that the plans in place to revive the pencil factory to create jobs for um, the youth of Asperma. And then he mentioned the uh, almost down Kumase airport. The second phase, a few days ago, President was in town to check on work, and we had the information that is more than 70% complete. Mr. Kankam mentioned that because it was part of his municipality, it's under his municipality, 
they are going to take advantage of that and rebrand um, Asquerma Paul with that. He believed that the bad name that Asquerma Paul municipality had had over the, over the years must be cleansed and a new uh, phase should start. And so he's going to use that as well to um, rebrand the Asquerma Paul municipality. So basically, there was, ex was excitement all through. Assembly members acknowledged that um, indeed. Earlier, most of them didn't want him, but later, after consulting with the uh, electorate, he understood and realized that it was important that he was given a chance to champion the development and supported to bring a new partner in the Asquema municipality, Aisha. Pia, eighth hour man in the Ashanti region. He's been doing this with Nanaya Ojima, but let's stay a while longer in the Ashanti region because this afternoon there's an advice for the new mayor of Kumasi. Former mayor of Kumasi, Kojo Bonso, has been advising some pine and encouraging him to uplift the status of the Kumasi metropolis. But he says he will need some mental toughness to be able to be successful. Listen. The appointment for the mayor of Kumasi, that's what really concerns me. Mm. Um, I think they've done a political appointment. I don't have anything against or have anything about the new appointed guy, Mr. Sampine. I've heard a lot about him. I've listened to him on radio. He makes very good arguments. But um, Kumasi's job is a bit different. I pray and hope that he can do what the Kumasi people want. The Kumasi people like boldness, somebody who can think outside of the force, and he, sh he should be well placed for the job and to be able to take decisions out of the box. Mm. Um, I would encourage him to be able to do well. Uh, looking at what has happened with all these local governance issues, are you for those who are calling for the voting of MMDCs? Yes, but I have it in a different way. The voting must be done um, outside the capital. So all the metropolitan assemblies should be elected by the president and the rest should be voted by the local people. Because the 16 regional metropolitan assembly needs to be people who, or someone, who understand what we call local government. Let's get more on this. Dr. Odro Sain, who's a local governance expert and a lawyer, joins me via Zoom for more on this. Dr. Sain, I'm grateful for your time. I'm sure you've been observing the confirmation of the MMDC nominees across the country, particularly in Kumasi, which happened today, and the confusion that greeted the exercise. What's your own assessment of the exercise so far? Thank you very much. I would say uh, so far so good. Uh, initially, we were all afraid, especially the warning and then the signal the assembly members uh, of KMA sent. But I'm happy at the end of the day, we have agreed and unanimously approved the mayor. The advice to the mayor now is that he should be a team player, he should be a unifier, he should listen to the sentiments of the people before they went into the room to vote for him. And I'm very positive that if he adds um, Kodjo Bonzo's advice to it, it will be a perfect mayor. But all in all, we are seeing a lot of 100% unanimous approval across the country. And I pray that it continues like that. That is what we need for effective local governance. But the message it sends to these approved MMDCs is that you shouldn't come and lord it over the people. Do what the people need. Think outside the box and ensure that you bring proper local governance to the people. Now, Sam Pine got the nod, but of course, there's been concerns about whether he has what it takes to deal with the challenges in Kumasi. I mean, for you, what should be his focus as uh, he's gotten the nod? First and foremost, he should be able to build consensus among all the people, the traditional authorities, the assembly members, and those in the electoral areas. Secondly, he should be a leader who can think outside the box. KMA needs a lot of things. KMA requires a strategic leader. KMA requires somebody who will be able to mobilize adequate resources, not only from taxation, but from other uh, uh, resources. You know? So I think that he should be a tough leader. 
not tough in terms of undermining democracy and people's freedom, but a tough leader as somebody who is strategic, who is prepared to go by his word, who is prepared to manage the place like a corporate entity. And I think he will be fine because the people in Kumasi expect nothing than the best and the best comes in when you are able to bring in the development they need. Sanitation must be a priority. Security must be a priority. And then ensuring that the debt issue they raised is adequately investigated so that if there is a need to mobilize resources from somewhere or work with government for the debt to be cleared, he should do that. So that at the end of the day, or as, by the time he exits, he should be able to hit his chest and say that, look, I came to KME as a mayor. I've done A, B, C, D, including clearing of the debt and people in Kumasi will feel safe to do business. Uh, is also a very hot area and I'm talking about the MCE, the mayor and the mayor nominee uh, who thankfully is a woman will be confirmed tomorrow. What are your expectations, Dr. Drosai? Thank you very much. Asha, I wonder why you said thankfully she's a woman. <laughs> um, because she's my fellow I know, woman. <laughs> I know that she's going to excel. Uh, Accra is like um, Kumasi, but Accra also expects a strategic leader but don't forget that this um, nominated uh, MCD for uh, the AME is a former Greater Accra, Deputy Greater Accra Regional Minister. And Correct. She's also been a former Assembly member mm. for the AME. So okay. she's somebody who knows the terrain. Mm. But the local governance has moved on. So I would expect her to also build consensus. I would expect her to understand the contemporary issues. I would expect her to appreciate the power brokers within the AMA. And I would expect her to keep an eye on resource mobilization. AMA is not the AMA that she used to know. But at the moment, a number of assemblies have been created out of AMA. And AMA is restricted to central Accra. It will be expected that she will be that tough to be able to clear people from the streets and ensure that she will step up her revenue mobilization achievement. All in all, I wish that he brings on board his other colleagues who could not get the nod and then tap on their expertise. Because these are experienced people who will be able to support her to be successful. I in, ter in, in terms of development, Dr. Drosai, what I mean specifically should, should be her focus uh, in the event that she gets the nod? Sanitation should be number one. And then number two, she should be able to look at the administrative structures of the assembly again. And then number, number three, I would expect that she would also give some priority to security. Mm. As the chair of the Metropolitan Security uh, Committee, I would expect that she works hand in hand with the regional uh, commander and the uh, Ghana Police Service. So these three should be of priority to her. In addition to that, she should work towards managing the businesses within the uh, metropolitan area. That is not to say that take over the businesses, but work with them so that they will live up to the expectation when it comes to corporate social responsibility obligations. Because once the businesses within the metropolitan area lives within their corporate social responsibility obligations, you'll be able to get a lot of resources to promote development in the area. Education must be a priority to her. She should also work towards reducing the noise in the city center. And I'm sure if she's able to do these things, she will be, she will be among the best in the country. And I'm glad you mentioned the noise because it's too much and it must be dealt with. I'm grateful for your time, Dr. Eric Odro Science, a local governance um, expert and also a lawyer. Now, from the Ashanti region, let's head to the Upper West Regional Capital of Wa, where the Assembly member for the Degu government residential area is demanding the arrest and prosecution of persons who slapped him during an Assembly meeting to approve the MCE nominee. Two others were also arrested during violence that erupted over a spoiled ballot, which was later accepted, tilting the votes in favor of the nominee. Rafiq Salam is uh, from the is our correspondent in the Upper West Region. He joins me via phone. Rafiq, first, what's the latest on those who were arrested last week? All right, so we 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 lost a Rafiq Salam. Okay, I'm told Rafiq Salam is back. Rafiq, uh, first tell us about. Uh, those who were arrested last week with regards to the confirmation? Uh, what happened was that uh, my church at the police station revealed that the two personalities that were arrested uh, were not charged 
Uh, they were not even made uh, to uh, even write any statement. What the police told me was that it was a, a crowd control measure, and that was the reason why they were picked outside the conference hall of the Iwa Municipal Assembly. So for now, there have not been any formal charge against them. And also the police also, on the other hand, are also saying that the man or the assembly member for the Devo government residential area, who also alleged that he was assaulted, has also not made any formal complaint as the police. And so it's also based on what the man complained of, or if he reports to the police, then the police will take the matter on. But for now, nothing has happened. Mm. So you've been speaking to the assemblyman who was a victim of the violence. What more uh, has he been saying? Uh, he spoke uh, on the issue and he stated categorically that for him, he will not recognize uh, the victory or the re-election uh, of uh, Honorable Elijah Stakutai the moment. Uh, for him, he thinks that it was a perfect uh, victory. Uh, he thinks that he didn't get the required uh, number of votes, the 30 votes. And so he thinks that he will not recognize him uh, as uh, the, district, uh, the municipal chief executive for the one municipal uh, area. But he's also talking about uh, going to court because he's saying that uh, for being allegedly assaulted, he's going to pursue the matter at a law court and then hopefully that you get justice there. Rafiq Salam, Mr. Aman. Hello? And yes, Rafiq Salam, you want to say more? Um, there are still uh, some confirmations that they are making uh, in the Upper West Virginia. Remember, Upper West were having 11 MDC, uh, uh, MDCs, and as I talk to you now, sex has already been confirmed. But the latest news today is not a good day for the Upper West Virginia Minister, Dr. Hafiz Bin Sali. Two of President's nominees, Laura and then Jirapa Municipalities, have been rejected by the various uh, families. And uh, starting with Laura, Martin Bombayra, he's a former biology master or tutor of Laura Senior High School. Uh, he was renominated for the second time by President Ekupado. He went into the assembly today, and then out of the 42 assembly men, 21 voted yes for him, and 40, uh, 21 again voted no. And so he has within 10 days to go back to the assembly for him to be confirmed. But he needs seven votes, seven votes in order to uh, get the required number of votes to sail through. On the other hand, the Juba Municipal uh, Chief Executive, who has also been renominated by President Kupado, Kristin Bombanya Amadu, also failed the test. At uh, this time around, out of the 53 Assembly members, uh, 21 of them voted no, and then 32 voted a yes for her. So she has the required number for her is 36. She needs uh, five people to cross within 10 days in order for her to be approved. So today, it's not a good day for the Apple Student Minister and his team. And so two, it's a matter of six down, two out, and then also three to go. So how many, okay, so uh, how many more left, uh, Rafiq, uh, kindly uh, for, for, wrap for, that for up? Now, for now, uh, the exercise started uh, at Nandom and then moved to Laura and then came uh, back to the one municipality and then also Sisala West, Sisala East, and then also the West. So all these uh, uh, nominees were confirmed. I think two areas, talking about Lamuse and then also what is there got the confirmation of 100%. And so today looked bright or uh, looked brighter for the Apple Australian Minister because the winning team was on until they got to Laura where they, had, where they hit Adafna. So for now, only three areas are left. Apple was 11 MDCs. So now, for now, six have been confirmed by by the assemblies, two rejected and then three to go. Okay. And starting from tomorrow, it will be uh, DBI, the female Bure Isa district, Nadoli, and also what was in that order. Certainly, we know Rafiq Salam will be there and monitor events for us and will bring you the updates as we have it. In the in Kuranza South Municipality in the Bono East region, Daina Atakis. Kusiwa, who has been nominated as MC, failed to get the required votes from assembly members. She's the only female nominee in the 11 assemblies of the region. Anas Sabit uh, has been monitoring this for us. He joins us with more. And asks how many votes did she get? And what have assembly members been saying influenced their decision to reject her? Alasha, uh, the nominee for 20 out of uh, a total of 42 votes cast. That represented 47.62% uh, of the total vote cast. And, um, you know, she, like you said earlier, is the only female nominee. She 
was in office between 2017 uh, to date that uh, from what we picked from the assembly members, uh, she did quite little in terms of developing the Nkranga South municipality. And so for them, um, the outcome of the elections is an indication that the people do not like her again. And so they are calling on the president to uh, bring a different nominee and whoever comes to have their backing uh, from our engagement with the people uh, on the ground. That was what happened yesterday at the Nkranga South uh, Municipal Assembly Hall. Today is the turn of the Ashtigua Mountain Municipality. This is the ninth uh, assembly that is been, uh, you know, going through the same process out of the 11. Now we are left with only two, Senate East and then Senate West, which will be done on Thursday. But uh, something interesting happened today during the confirmation of the Ashtigua Mountain team. The media personnel who were present were all denied access into the assembly hall, which is quite strange because uh, of all the eight assemblies we covered earlier from last week, uh, we've been granted access to all the uh, electoral process until today when we got the uh, security personnel led by the police. And then some party staff were ordered not to allow the media personnel to get into the hall to witness the event. So we have to stay outside forcefully. Uh, for the processes to uh, continue. And later we were told the candidate, the nominee, had been uh, confirmed, pulling 43 out of the 45 votes cast. Anna Sabet is our man in the Bono East region with the update of confirmation of MMDC nominees. We're still monitoring across the country as the confirmation exercise goes on and definitely trust Joy News to bring you all the sights and sounds. We take a break on The Pulse. Remember, you can tweet at us with the hashtag The Pulse. My personal handle is at the Nana Aisha. We have more after this break. Do stay tuned in. Welcome back to The Pulse. We are live on uh, Go TV channel 144, DSTV channel 421. We are also on uh, DTT because we are free to wear. You can also join us by all our social media handles at Joy News on TV and tweet at us with the hashtag The Pulse this afternoon as we celebrate teachers across the world. Teacher trainees across Ghana are up in arms with government over delays in the payment of their allowances. The allowances scrapped by the Mahama administration was restored by President Ekufuado on assumption of office. The teacher trainees say it is crucial to their survival in school. But for the last six months, there's not been any payment by government. They have issued a three-week ultimatum as a result, uh, failure of which they say they will advise themselves. We've been joined uh, via Zoom by Joshua Wusu Yabua, who is National Coordinator of the Teacher Training Association of Ghana. Joshua, I'm grateful for your time this afternoon. What has been the response from government so far? Why this delay? I'm so grateful for such opportunity given to me. I'll uh, first of all say a very good afternoon or evening to all teacher trainees across the 46 public colleges of education in Ghana. Uh, Masha, we as leadership, we believe in diplomatic ways of solving issues. When the issue of the allowance came, we have been on Ghana Tertiary Education Commission, which is GTEC, as well as the Ministry of Information, uh, Education, on this allowance issue. We have spoken lengthy with them just last month, that is September, we were told that in the middle of September, the allowance is going to be paid. But we leadership, we came out with a release and informed our membership that by the end of September, the allowance too is going to be paid. We sat there and now we are in 5th October. The allowance hasn't been paid. And that is why we have come out with this release. Teacher trainees are indeed suffering because us, I am speaking, we have our constituents who are doing their outcome segment, that is their teaching practice. And with this, they are supposed to rent their own apartment, buy their own food, and majority of trainees depend on this allowance for their um, survival in college. And now that the allowance is not coming, how do we go by it? We have been promised over the years, we have been promised that the, the allowance will be coming. 
by assistance now, it is not coming. So this warranted us to come out with this release by giving the government three weeks ultimatum. If we don't hear anything from them, we will advise ourselves, as you said. And if you say you would advise yourself, I want to understand what does that mean? In TAG, we work with hierarchy. So we, uh, the National Executive Council will have a meeting and we will have a way forward regarding how we are going to solve this issue. Mm. And I mean, as a way forward, what are some of the things you intend to do to actually push government to pay you your allowances? That one will be determined by the National Executive Council when the time. All right. We wish you all the best as you uh, endeavor to demand your allowances from government. Joshua, he is the coordinator. Uh, Joshua Usuyabwa is a coordinator for the uh, Teacher Training Association of Ghana. In an effort to complement government's clamp down on illegal miners, the tax force of the Ghana National Association of Small Scale Miners uh, has uh, apprehended 13 persons for illegally mining in the eastern region. The suspects include Ghanaians and other West African nationals. They were caught mining on the Birim River at Aching Mampo near uh, Enyenim, Accra village in, in Ketiaso and Monchuri, all in the Etrima district. Edwin Kofi Siao has more in the following report. The task force also destroyed and retrieved over 100 chamfai machines, water pumping machines, and other mining equipment. The arrest follows a similar exercise conducted by the Lands and Natural Resources Ministry a few days ago at Brim North and Asante Achim South districts of the Eastern and Ashanti regions, respectively. The Special Ministerial Operation, led by Deputy Minister George Mekuduka, saw the arrest of six illegal miners and the destruction of several mining equipment. Oh. Patrick Don Chibi is the commander of the Small Scale Miners Task Force. There is a village called Accra Village. We started from there, three people were arrested, brought to Enyanam Police Station. And today we embark on the operation in Mampong and uh, in Kati, so and Mochri. There are places named, and these are the people we apprehended. So as we went, uh, they were doing this illegal mining that we said they should stop. And they were washing into the Brim River direct. The task force commanders have we've started. We want to tell the general public that we are not going to stop and we'll make sure that those doing these illegalities must put a stop to that. The communication director of the association, Razak Alassan, says illegal miners will stop at nothing to destroy the rivers in the eastern region. According to him, the association will put in every effort to clamp down on them and identify their financiers. Since in the morning, so far, over 60 chamfan uh, machines are destroyed. And we've apprehended over 10 people. So right now we are, we are still screening to know the actual corporate. And we are looking for the sponsors themselves, those who are financing them, those who are sending them to this, to, uh, the, to this riverside. Because some of them, for instance, yesterday, when we were even asking them, some of them were telling us that they have some bosses. And they, they can't disclose their, uh, they, they don't even know their bosses' names. Especially some uh, Voltairean that we, uh, we, got, we got him yesterday. He was not, he didn't even understand what he came to do. He, they brought him and then even to identify his boy, he doesn't, he doesn't even know where he, the boss is. So we are looking for such people and we, are, we, we, we had the information that some of the uh, contingents and uh, sub-chiefs and the uh, Bushampenis, they are also involved. The suspects will be put before the law courts in the coming days. Kofisian reporting for Joy News. <laughs> The Ghana Maritime Authority has donated 10,490 out of about 21,003 stamps removed from the Volta Lake and Oche River to the chiefs and people in surrounding communities. The three stamps were the major case of boat accidents and the loss of lives and property. Officials of the authority made the donation at Dodoekope and Njari, both in the Oche region. Paramount chief of Chonket traditional area, Dasibre Atama Foriase, 
Kwame Boja II, the overlord of Chonke, said the lives of their people have significantly improved since the removal of the stamps. He says farmers and market women are now able to convey their farm produce and works to market centers without any danger to their lives. He expressed his gratitude to the Ghana Maritime Authority. Ghana Maritime Authority. We thank the Ghana Maritime Authority for the kind gesture. Our lives have been saved. Our friends who went through difficulties to cut the tree stumps. For us, they are not here, but extend our gratitude to them. Board no, then the director. Now my penny, I be a jumaya mai. Then there I want to abba. Then there ni muchi ya di hongo mo. Now we say di a jumaya che inside here. As a dance your director, we need to bring for there. Officials of the authority sensitize the locals on the need to observe safety protocols, including loathing within limits, wearing of life jackets, avoiding alcoholism, and the use of waste bins to prevent littering the waters. Boat operators were also encouraged to install two outboard motors on their boats to cater for any contingencies. The Maritime Security Coordinator, a GMA Commander Festo Sosebro Bay, addressed market women and the boat operators. We are still in the COVID era. As the president said, we should observe the safety protocols. We should make sure we are loading within limit. We can't keep taking the same loads as we used to because COVID is still here. Oh, yes, sir. Passengers now. We need If passengers are affected by the virus, you want to get them to board your motors again. We'll be back uh, from this break. And when we return, we're bringing you uh, the very latest from the sports world. Stay tuned in. Time to bring you sports here on The Pulse. I am Hans Mensa and on a worrying development in Ghana Latest because the General Secretary of the Ghana Latest Association, Bao Fuseni, he's revealed the sport lacks elite coaches due to their inability to pass the level one courses. And Bauer joins me on the line as well as um, Elom Amenako, also um, an athletics coach. Bao Fuseni is the General Secretary of the Ghana Athletics Association. Bauer, thank you very much. And I mean, this certainly should be a worry for the Ghana Athletics Association. Uh, thank you very much, Hans. Um, Elam, nice to see you. It's certainly, it's, a, it's, certainly, it's certainly a worry situation. If you organize a program uh, for coaches to progress to the next level, and at the end of the course, you don't find anybody going through to the second level, it's certainly a worrying situation. I can clearly say that if you are a proprietor of an institution like the JSS, and I don't know the third year examination and no single student from your JSS is able to progress to the secondary school level, as a proprietor, you, you will not be happy. You will not be happy. So it's a serious issue that um, we are discussing, and we're also doing what we can do within our power to resolve that issue or to prevent anything or other happening in the near future. Now, Bao, I mean, give us a sense. Um, when was the last time this course was held? 
The last time was in 2014. Okay. 2000, January, February 2014. And we are doing, doing another one in November this year. Okay. And, and is that the one you point to the outcomes as being 100% failure on the part of the coaches who participated? That was the 2014 one. That was the 2014. Um, yeah, the 2014. After I, I was not in the office. I had just uh, procured the, the, the opportunity to organize it, and I left. And that time, Dominic Kankam was the secretary general of the athletics at that time, and they did and they did the course. Let me make it this one clear that the course is in two parts: okay. theory and practicals. Right. And to be able to progress, you need to have seventy-five percent in each okay. before you can progress to level two. And this is marked over four, so you either get four over four or three over four. If you get anything less than three. If considered as a failure, you are not going to progress to any level. So all those who did it, they either have four over three and two over four, or they have two over two, two over two. Okay. And the list you could get in the IWF coaching course is to be able to get three over four, the minimum, or four over four. If you get either practicals or theory, anything less than three, you are not going to progress and is considered as failure. So in that particular course, none of those who participated in it had three over three and three over three. Which would mean that they didn't progress to the next stage of the course. Now, um, as an association, I mean, this, you know, got you worried. Did you investigate to find out what caused, you know, participants to fail in that manner? Yes, we did. We did. Um, when we came, we started looking into it since um, since last year, and we realized that there were two issues: either they took the course so simple, or they didn't have enough preparation. Okay. So we did a proposal to the World Athletics, mm. citing the Ghana hosting All African Games as a um, as something that we need to beef up or build our capacity of not only our coaches but also our officiating officials. Right. In that proposal, we suggested that the World Athletics should support us with funding and technical expertise for us to go around and do preparatory courses for all our coaches in Ghana. Mm. So that before the coaches will come for the level one, they might have gone through certain preparation and certain uh, advanced learning. Okay. Before they come before to the they, level they get one. into that one. Okay. Ho yes. Hold it there for me, um, Bawa. Let me yes. let me get a quick word from Elon. Elon, thank you very much for joining me. And you are a coach. Um, give us a sense that you did you take this same, you know, examination or course? No, uh, I've never. By then, I was in school. I was in uh, level four hundred. I think the course was actually around somewhere around November twenty fourteen. But then I was doing my internship uh, as uh, one of the university. So I didn't. I didn't. Okay. So, so what's your current education? You know, um, as a coach, what, what's what's your current level? Well, like uh, the CEO said, uh, the last time the course was organized was the, uh, was two thousand and fourteen. So I am having a back of coaching. That's the certification that I'm having. So I don't have the word at least. Uh, okay. Okay. Now, when, when you hear of uh, such a development that the last time this was held, all the participants could not progress to the next level, that, does it worry you? And for you who, you know, of course, should be preparing to take this, this certification, how are you preparing towards it? Well, uh, it's, it's, it worried me and then it's uh, quite unfortunate uh, because I think if, uh, like the CEO, CEO has said, if there were a lot of uh, passes, uh, I think by now I would have had uh, the opportunity to also take part in the course. But I, I did take part. Uh, I think uh, some criteria should be put in place okay. uh, to, yeah, to, to, to ask and know who should be given the opportunity to take the course. Because the failure or people not failing have actually created uh
Hello, Elam. Okay, we seem to be having a challenge with um, um, Elam's line. Let, um, let me get a quick one from you, Bauer, if you're still on the line. The situation whereby some of us are not able to also take part. It's been uh, almost seven years since uh, the course had organized. So okay. Okay, hello. Just hold a thought for me, um, Bawa. What sort of persons participate in this course? Do you have a requirement um, for admission to this particular program? Um, are we looking at physical education instructors, former athletes? What What is the criteria? Is it or is it open to anybody at all? Said that people without a background in athletics often find themselves there for which reason they lack the basics to be able to progress. Um, that is that was one of the issues. And at those times, they just gave it to regions to send representatives or the, the, the institution to just send people to come and participate. But this time around, we are going to set standards. Okay. Even the courses that we did, uh, we did some small tests at the end of the courses. If you do not pass the test, we are not going to allow you to come for this particular level one. And if one is not a graduate in PE, in physical education, either a diploma or a third degree, we are not going to be allowed to come. Elon has a degree in coaching from the University of Winneba, a University of Education Winneba. That is also another criteria that we are going to use. Mm. So that before anybody at all who come to take that course, you might have gone through certain coaching courses, either the primary, either the preparatory, either the physical education is or the coaching course, either at diploma level or a degree level. Okay. So that we we have we did that for the official official course and we had 50% passes. Okay. And that because of that, the World Athletics have given us opportunity to organize level two in Ghana. Right. So at the end of November, if we get at least 50% passed in this coaching course, we also have another opportunity to do the level two in Ghana. And okay. people like Elam and Co can go can through all part. these processes. Okay. Right. Um, thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, Bao Futini is the General Secretary of the Ghana Athletics Association, and Elon Aminakpo is also an athletics coach speaking to us on a rather worrying development, and, and it has to do with, uh, you know, a 100% failure uh, for participants who um, try to get through the athletics coaching course. This was in 2014. They said they are preparing for another one later this year. Of course, that would be all for now. You can read more at myjoyonline.com forward slash sport. I am Hans Mensando. And as I wrap up the polls this afternoon, my name is Aisha Ibrahim. It's been great hosting you. Up next is Let's Talk Showbiz. Do enjoy the rest of our programs. <laughs>